file of men moves slowly through the night to the mysterious cave by the sea to unveil the stories of the past. Listen to the weird circle. gone by speak again the immortal tale a terrible night silence in the court next witness please if your honor please the next witness is Charles Costar the defendant in this case Will Mr. Costar please take the stand? Silence in the court. Place your left hand on the Bible. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Suppose, Mr. Costar, you tell this court your story in your own words. From the... the very beginning? Uh, don't be afraid. From the very beginning. Well, I... I don't know where to start, to be honest. I... I feel like a man that's drowning. I guess it started the night my wife, Bertha, and her brother, Dick Linton, were helping me to pack my suitcase. Dick and I were preparing to go on a hunting trip in Canada in the northwest section when... And don't forget to put the compass in, Charlie. A hunting man needs a compass, you know. Sure he does. Keeps him from getting lost. <laughs> See how bright my wife is, Dick? She knows all the answers. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. I know, Bertha, I know. <laughs> It's just that when a gal's brother and husband go gallivanting off on a hunting trip to the North Woods, a gal wants to know they're coming back safe. Now you worry about Charles, Bertha. You know me. I never get lost. You remember the camping trips we used to take when we were kids? You were a Boy Scout then, Dick. He's no Boy Scout now. Hey. <laughs> well, let's see, darling. Have I, uh, I got everything packed in here? Yes, dear, everything. Wool and underwear? You're a lucky man to have a wife gun like cartridges? my sister, Charles. For both guns? Mm-hmm. The cartridges for the hunting gun are in the uh, rear pocket of the suitcase. Uh -huh. And for the thirty-eight, they're in your holster. Oh, good girl. Where's your suitcase, Dick? Oh, it's checked at the station. Hey, what time is it? Well, it's almost 10 p.m. Oh, we better be going along, darling. I like to catch my trains with ease. I'll help you close the suitcase, Chubb. The best suitcase sitter runner in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, there, that does it. You can get off now. <laughs> <laughs> Have a nice trip, both of you. Bring back at least two dozen deer. Oh, at least, sis. Bye, honey. <laughs> Bye. Oh, don't forget your muffler, darling. It's in the closet downstairs. And please, please be careful... When little boys play with guns, well, you know how dangerous guns can be. So, we left, Dick and I. We took the express to Montreal and then traveled by train west of the Hudson Bay to the Northwest Territory, specifically to a small town known as Fort Ray. What equipment we hadn't already purchased, we purchased there. Mostly food provisions and plenty of coffee. Then, on the morning of September 3rd, Dick and I started out on foot, it was a clear, brisk morning, and the air was alive with sounds. Birds chirping, the constant crunch of leaves underfoot. We were both in high spirits, as Dick said. Oh, this is the life, old boy. This is what a man needs. To get away from civilization and breathe again. Yeah, back to nature. Mm -hmm. Back to nature's right. You know, there's something the matter with modern civilization. You get all jogged up inside. Begin to think all sorts of strange things. Strange, Dick? In what way? Oh, morbid thoughts. Hating yourself, hating everybody else, hating the world. You know, that's bad for a writer. His work becomes bitter and he pours the gall out in words. Paints the world he sees in gray overtones. You mean like that last story you sold? Yeah. It was a depressing story, but that was my mood. Both you and Bertha have morbid emotional streaks. Well, Sis and I are very much alike in many ways. Huh. Funny my marrying Bertha. What's so funny about it? You know, uh, I engineered it. You did? Why? Well, Bertha and I have always been pretty close, you know. Much closer than ordinary brother and sister. I didn't want to see her marry some clerk. Well, thanks, Dick. You be my roommate at college, I got to know you pretty well. Yes, sis and I have the same likes and dislikes, and I just knew you were right for her. You mean to tell me I didn't have anything at all to say about it? Mm, sort of. Sort of? <laughs> <laughs> well, Bertha's beauty, her... Chemistry, if you like, and youth took care of the rest. 
You sound like an old, old man airing philosophy. I told you I've been civilized too long. You've been a bachelor too long. I think I'll dig up a nice young girl for you. Marriage is a sensation, Dick. Well worth a try. Well, I don't quite like the idea of digging up a girl for me. Sounds like she's been buried already. <laughs> um, here, we turn this way, to the north now. Uh, are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I know these north woods like a... Oh, like, like a book. A, yes, like a book. You'll never get lost with me. We'll be at the next port by six this evening. I still think we ought to have taken a guide along. Oh, nonsense. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about at all. Just stick to Dick Linton and you can't go wrong. Nothing to worry about. That's the way writers are. So sure of themselves. Except they ought to stick to paper and pencil, not to their memories of North Woods. At six o'clock in the evening, there wasn't a fort in sight. And by ten o'clock that night, even diehard Dick had to admit... Well, we're lost. No. Yeah, we're lost. I'm sorry, Charles. Mm. Oh, you're being pretty monosyllabic about the whole thing. Normal, under the circumstances. Hey, that wasn't the wind, was it, Dick? No, uh, wolves. Wolves? Hmm. Not afraid of them, are you? Oh, no, I love them. Especially at night when I'm cold and hungry. And they are, too. Well, we'll have to sleep in the trees. You'll have to sleep in the trees. I wasn't built that way. You can't sleep on the ground. You'll never live through the night if you... I'm not sleeping on the ground, Dick. I'm walking until we find someplace. Well, we might not find the fort till tomorrow morning. Or tomorrow evening. But whenever it is, I'm going to find it as soon as possible. Uh, even sooner than that, if that keeps up. You coming with me? Sure, I'm with you. Oh, boy, I'm hungry. Oh, say, wouldn't a nice, thick, luscious steak taste good? You know, one of the charcoal broil variety dripping with butter and fried onions? Oh, stop it. Or oh, one of Bertha's lamb stews with mashed potatoes and rich tomato gravy. If you want to die, just keep on talking. Just the thought of food, and I'm a murdering maniac. Oh, uh, how about a real English roast beef with Yorkshire pudding? Oh, you're asking for it. <laughs> hmm, I wonder just how hungry that wolf is. Maybe he won't mind if his meat isn't cooked, huh? I'm sure he won't. They're carnivori, which means in Latin, carnivorous or man-eaters. Or... Hey, Charlie. Huh? Look, straight ahead of you. Isn't that a light over there? Well, yeah, I think so. Hey, maybe it's the fort. No, it's not the fort here. We're miles off the beaten track. Well, what is it, then? I don't know. Looks like a cabin from here. Oh, I'm not particular. Let's find out. Fine, I'll lead the way. Oh, no. You've led the way so far, but this time, Dick, my boy, I'm leading. Follow Charlie and see some food. Food? Food. Whoever lives there must eat. Maybe it's not steak, but it's something. It is a cabin, all right. Sh shall I knock on the door? Well, you can't get in any other way. Huh, who can't? This rickety old shack could be blown down by a good strong breath. Hmm? Funny looking place, isn't it? I'm not amused. Knock on the door. Such a timid knock. Uh, my hand's numb. Yeah, we'll try it again. Hope this guy's friendly. Uh-oh. Our friends are sniffing about again. And I don't look at all well in tomato sauce. Oh, Charlie. Evening. Something I can do for you, gentlemen? Uh... We, uh, we, we managed to... Uh, we, uh, we hope to find some place to stay for the night, sir. We're, we're completely off the beaten track. No, uh -huh. you don't say. Come in. Come in, gentlemen. Uh, yes. I'd be delighted to put you up this evening if you don't mind sleeping on the floor in the attic. Well, at this point, we don't mind anything. Don't you? Uh, uh, my name's uh, Charles Costar, sir, and uh, my friend is Dick Linton. How do you do? Yeah. My name is Joel. Just Joel. At least, they used to call me Joel. Have you eaten yet this evening? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, and we're starving. Well, come in and sit down, and I'll fix you some dinner. That is, if you don't mind my meager rations. Oh, we don't mind anything at this point. Uh, do we, Dick? Oh, no, no, definitely not. Yeah. Uh, there's an old American saying, you know, uh, food is food. <laughs> Let's eat, huh? I'll fry some deer steak for you, and I have some wine. Oh, wonderful. Uh, tell me, Mr. Joel, uh, do you live here all alone? Unfortunately, yes. You see, I'm an outcast from your society. 
But a man be different, and in automatically he becomes an outcast. Yeah, there, there's something in what you say. Let him look a little different, or think a little different, or speak a little different. And he becomes a marked man. The individual is not allowed the privilege of individuality. Mankind doesn't permit it. Oh, I... I don't think so, really. Don't you? I'll just set the table and you can sit down over here and eat. Uh, come along, Charles. Here. I can prove my point. Now, look at me. I'm different. Larger than most men, I unfortunately grew too tall. And I'm too ugly for the average man to... to stomach. I was hated. Yes, hated by your civilization and feared, too. Not because I was cruel or vindictive or dishonest, but because I was different. Yes, yes, I'm a giant in stature. Uh, uh, well, I... Uh, uh, don't feel badly for me. I've had my revenge on society, and I'll have even more revenge on little people like yourselves. Mm. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, it's quite understandable that you feel that way. Uh, gentlemen, before you sit down to dinner, allow me to hang your hunting guns up here. They'll bother you if you carry them around. Oh, well, we really don't mind. I mind. Your hunting gun, sir. And your hunting gun. There. Now I both are just hang them up here. Uh, you say you live alone, uh, Joel? Yes. That shoe in the corner, that was never your shoe. It's too small for you. You're very observant, Mr. Linton. No, that wasn't my shoe. I found it in the forest one day and brought it home for the purpose of remaking it, like that coat hanging over there. Found a coat and a shoe lying in this outlandish district? Yes, yes, a coat and a shoe. Of course, they were on a man, but... He was dead. He died of... I don't quite know what he died of. His legs had been gnawed off by some prowling beasts. Oh, he, he must have become uh, uh, lost out here, like ourselves, huh? Exactly like yourselves, gentlemen. Exactly like yourselves. Dinner's ready. in the car. Now, go ahead with your testimony, Mr. Castar. Well, you can see what a spot Dick and I were in. We we didn't trust that man for a second. Believe me, he was... Well, darn it, anyway, the man was unbalanced. It was well after we finished eating dinner that Joel lit a good, warm, roaring fire in the fireplace, and then... Well, gentlemen, it's time to retire. I'm sleepy, and I'm sure you two are. Uh, yes, very sleepy. Uh, mind if we take our guns upstairs? I'd uh, like to clean you them. You won't need them this evening. You can clean them in the morning. Come along, please. Uh, yeah, uh, come on, Charlie. Yeah, I'm right behind you, Dick. Be careful of this stepladder. It's rickety, to say the least. <laughs> so I notice, yeah. I'll go first and get the blankets out. Yes, fortunately, I have two blankets up here, although they're musty enough. Oh, don't worry about us. Horace, come up now. Uh, right away. I'd feel a lot better if I had those hunting guns, and I don't blame you. You can see for yourself, Mr. Linton, that this attic is not accustomed to guests. Musty. And the spiders are troublesome to strangers. Spiders? They are my friends. My only friends. They say he who shares a roof with you automatically becomes your friend. They have shared this roof with me for many years. Good night, gentlemen. Sleep well. Oh, good night. Great Scott, what, what kind of a mess have we gotten ourselves into? I don't know. 
He's got a cog loose in his mind somewhere, that's certain. Very certain. What'll we do? I'll tell you. One sleeps and the other stands guard. That won't do us any good, Dick. He's ten times our size, and besides, we're unarmed. Oh, I've got your thirty-eight in my pocket. What? Did you forget about it, huh? Yeah, I did. Look, through these boards in the attic. You can watch Joel very easily. The fireplace throws a nice light on him. How will we arrange the watch? Well, you go to sleep for an hour. Yeah. Then I'll wake you up, give you the gun, and then I'll go to sleep for an hour, and you stand guard, okay? Yeah. Uh, what time is it now? Uh, 1 a.m. <sighs> What's he doing down there? He's curling up on the floor near the fireplace. About to go to sleep. I hope he sleeps well. <sighs> Too well to wake up. In case he doesn't, I hope your gun works. That's all. Oh, I'm so sleepy. Good night. <sighs> Proceed, Mr. Costello. Yes, I... I put my head on the floor and slept. But I slept a troubled sleep. A restless sleep. And my hands kept clawing the floor. A floor that was alive with insect life. Then, no sooner had I put my head on the floor than it seemed Dick nudged me. Wake up. Wake up. It's 2 a.m. Uh, huh? Huh? Oh, okay. Okay. What happened? Nothing. It's your turn now. Oh, I'm really licked. Really licked. So much walking and then all this. He was quite right. All this. He lay down on the floor, and soon he was sound asleep. Sleeping like he was drugged. Poor Dick was all in. I sat upright, concentrating on sitting upright, to keep my eyes from closing. I was so tired and... My blood ran cold as I kept my eyes glued to the still figure which lay beneath us. The hut was so quiet that my wristwatch sounded like the beating of tom-toms in that silence. Tick, 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 beating off the seconds, perhaps slicing off the seconds left of our lives. And I waited and watched, waited and watched. Then suddenly the huge figure beneath me stretched his huge form in front of the fireplace and yawned. His large, expressionless eyes sought mine through the planks of the floor, and I thought for a moment he saw me sitting there. Perhaps my crouched figure in the attic somehow threw a shadow down on the floor of the hut below. Then he arose, cat-like. That huge form arose gracefully and quietly. He eased himself up and walked to the door, as if listening for someone or something. Then, just as quietly, he opened the door and... Yes? Yes? Yes, come back shortly. Shortly. He said, come back shortly. Who was he talking to? And what was he talking about? Come back. Come back to murder us. He shut the door just as gently as he opened it. And then returning to the place before the fire, he again curled up near the warmth of the blaze. I glanced down at my watch. It was three o'clock. I nudged Dick gently at first. And then harder. Dick, your turn. Dick, Dick, wake up. Oh, hour up so soon. Yes. Here, here's the gun. Okay, I'm awake. Anything happen? Listen, he's got an accomplice. What? Somebody was standing outside the door a while back. He told him to come back shortly. That explains the small shoe, maybe. Maybe. Oh, I'm so tired, I don't think I can sleep. I, I don't think I can sleep. Ah, you'll sleep. Just relax. I don't think so. Really, I... I... Come in. Come in. Yeah? Are they asleep now? Yes, fast asleep, the poor fools. One of them thought he could stay awake. I could see them taking turns staying awake but I put enough dope in their wine to knock them out completely. Have they much money with them? Who knows? But whatever they have, we need. Here, give me that log you brought in. Here you are. Now I'll splinter it like this. And light one end of us. Nothing like this wood burning to dope them completely. What did we do with them later? Put them outside for the animals. Hmm. I'll wait down here for you. You go upstairs. I won't be long. These things never take very long. Dick. Dick. Give me the gun. Give me the gun. Huh? Dick. Dick. Have you fallen asleep? Dick, wake up. 
Dick, are you doped? Uh, Dick, he's coming at us. Give me the gun. Give me the gun. Please, Dick, give me the gun. There. There, I've got the gun now. <laughs> You're laughing at me. You're laughing. Time to wake up now for the last time. No, take this. <laughs> there. There, that's got you. That's got you. That's got you. Where's your friend? Where's the little man? Dick, help me find the little man now. Help me, help me, help me. Dick? Dick! I was stunned. Completely stunned. The room looked strange to me. The smoking gun in my hand looked strange to me. The whole world seemed to blot out in front of my eyes, and suddenly I looked down at the dark mass lying at my feet, and then I looked up. My eyes were absolutely level with Joel's eyes as he climbed up into the attic. Then, in a voice filled with horror, he said, Great Lord, sir, what have you done? You've killed him, and he was just about to wake you. Yes, I killed Dick Linton, my best friend, when he was just about to wake me. I'd been dreaming, and I killed him. Thank you, Mr. Castar. My next witness is Dr. Harding. Now, Dr. Harding, will you please take the stand? Yes, sir. Place your left hand on the Bible. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. You heard the testimony of the defendant, Dr. Harding? I did, sir. Is it possible for a man, a man asleep as he was, to fire the gun load at his best friend because of a nightmare? It was more than a nightmare. It was somnolentia, sleep drunkenness. Overtired as Mr. Costair was, his nerves were overtaxed and his fears and suspicions had been aroused. This result is perfectly natural and certainly medically sound. The defendant was not in his right mind at the time of the murder. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harding. Uh, gentlemen of the jury, to sum up this case, Joel the Giant had told his guests the truth about the shoe. At the time he opened the door... He was just talking to his dog, who had been scratching outside. But to a man mentally exhausted and filled with fear, Joel's actions were certainly those which would arouse suspicion. Gentlemen, in behalf of my client, I beg leniency. Leniency. Bertha. Bertha, please, darling. It was all explained in court. This doesn't change anything between us, nothing at all. Doesn't it? I love my brother more than you can understand, Charles. I know the court has ruled you innocent. But a court of law has very little to do with a woman's heart. If you love me, Bertha... I'll always love you. But I'll never be able to trust you again. There are seven days in a week, Charles. Some of those days, I'll love you and forget this whole horrible affair. But... More days, my brother's face will loom up in front of me. But Dick would understand. I wouldn't see you, because his face would stand between us. I'd spend those days hating you. So, I'm leaving you, Charles. Take good care of yourself. I... I can't help it. I hope you understand. Bertha, please... Bye, Charles. Bertha! I told you, Charles Castar, I hate civilized society. Don't feel badly for me. I'll have my revenge on society. I'll have even more revenge on little people like you. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought to you the story, A Terrible Night. Bellkeeper, toll the bell.